So what I will be presenting to you today is the ultrasound study of the median nerve in carpal tunnel disease as we have structured it at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Uh, I first would like to give credit to Orlin Hedjeff, our resident, and Rachel Hewlin, our fellow, who have done a lot of work uh, both in uh, looking at normal carpal tunnel and abnormal carpal tunnel. Joseph Craig, uh, a staff from the Henry Ford Hospital, and Dr. Didmars, who is a plastic surgeon, driving some of the research we have been doing on uh, carpal tunnel disease. Ultrasound of carpal tunnel disease, what I'll be showing uh, is the old, the old stuff, the things we've done, been doing for years, and now for more than 14 years in carpal tunnel uh, static anatomy analysis, some of the anatomy and the pathology, uh, but also some of the newer things, uh, newer occupational hazards, occupational uh, injuries in, that are causing carpal tunnel disease, and some of the dynamics that we have noticed on uh, ultrasound in uh, or within the carpal tunnel. The goal of my lecture is uh, to stop some here in the room from considering carpal tunnel disease as a static disease and really start thinking of carpal tunnel as a dynamic disease. As background, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome has previously been described to affect certain occupations, and in particular, we're thinking of typists, uh, transcriptionists, musicians, piano players, violinists, but also sonographers and uh, people working with small uh, tools like dentists and dental hygienists um, and factory workers. Now, within the last 10 years, the equipment has become so uh, sensitive and the imaging of carpal tunnel and of median nerve has dramatically improved over time. So that accurate identification of the median nerve is now uh, becoming a routine study. Compression of the median nerve can be reliably identified and localized by ultrasound, and it has been shown uh, in several papers that the cross-sectional diameter of the nerve uh, somewhat correlates with EMG findings and that there is a cutoff if one measures the surface area of the median nerve of 10 square millimeters or 0.1 square centimeters uh, for uh, patients with carpal tunnel disease are typically over that number. Patients under this number typically have normal uh, median nerves. In terms of where to measure, what are the anatomical uh, considerations in terms of placement of the transducer, uh, several papers have shown that the distal palmar crease is an easy landmark to uh, place, transducer, place a transducer for carpal tunnel measurement in that it's just uh, proximal to the entrance to the carpal tunnel and that's where most of the swelling is noticed uh, surgically. That carpal crease, which is indicated by the arrows, the distal, uh, uh, distal palmar crease, corresponds to about the radiocarpal joint and is just proximal to the carpal tunnel. So studies also have shown excellent correlation between ultrasound diagnosis and the increased cross-sectional area with electroneurographic findings. Uh, studies, one of the studies we have published in radiologic clinics of North America, actually Dr. Duhi Lee, who worked with plastic surgery department at Henry Ford Hospital, published that in 1999. Some other anatomic considerations, uh, the median nerve is actually covered by the uh, flexor retinaculum as shown here, and there are two tethers of that flexor retinaculum, uh, a superficial and a deep tether, uh, surrounding the flexor pollicis longus. For your reference, the flexor carpi radialis uh, tendon is actually not part of the carpal tunnel, but some of our measure measurements are going to be referred to that tendon at the lateral aspect of the carpal tunnel. When you take the flexor retinaculum away, this is the median nerve, normally coursing deep to the flexor retinaculum. For orientation, this is the flexor pollicis longus at the lateral aspect of the median nerve. And this is the flexor to the middle finger at the medial border of the median nerve. Median nerve location relative to bones, actually in the middle of the carpal tunnel, the median nerve is located over the capitate bone. 
Now, traditional teachings in plastic surgery and in uh, the clinical setting has, have shown that or have, have always believed that repetitive motion and flexion and pronation of the wrist uh, might induce carpal tunnel, and that's, a, that's actually the basis for the Phelan test. New findings of studies we have done at Henry Ford have shown that pinching, a pinch maneuver in pronation and flexion uh, is also implicated in the development of symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. Now we often visualize the median nerve as a static structure located anterior to the flexor tendons in the carpal tunnel. However, cadaver dissections uh, that we have done have demonstrated that the median nerve to be a very flexible structure, structure capable of both lateral and sagittal motion within the carpal tunnel. Here shown as a cadaver dissection after the transection of the uh, flexor retinaculum showing the, the location of the median nerve. Now the median nerve on ultrasound has been shown to have a fibrillar, uh, hypoechoic, or slightly echogenic structure, volar to the tendon, the flexor tendons, and at the ulnar aspect of the flexor pollicis longus, and the flexor carpi radialis. Now the flexor carpi radialis is a good uh, ultrasound landmark for re re referencing the relative motion of the median nerve due its, to its uh, relative constant position uh, relative to the scaphoid bone. So just looking at this with ultrasound, this is a cross-section the through the carpal tunnel. This is the radial side of the carpal tunnel. This is actually the scaphoid bone. Uh, this is the capitate bone. And over that capitate and the very volar soft tissues of the carpal tunnel is the flat uh, structure of the median nerve. This is the flexor carpi radialis, which is actually sitting outside the carpal tunnel, flexor carpi radialis, a good reference point and a constant reference point for the location of the median nerve. Flexor digitorum shown relative to the median nerve, flexor carpi radialis. Now there is movement of the median nerve during pronation of the hand. It's not uncommon for the median nerve to demonstrate either ulnar or radial mobility during pronation of the forearm. We've actually studied that in asymptomatic wrists showing that there doesn't seem to be a predilection towards, towards what side the nerve is moving. Sometimes it moves to the radial side, sometimes it moves to the ulnar, ulnar side of the wrist, but there is movement uh, observable by ultrasound. Showing here in supination the location of the median nerve relative to the capitate bone and relative to the flexor carpi radialis. However, when you pronate the hand, you will notice that in this patient, the nerve moves towards the radial aspect of the wrist. A significant movement of the median nerve during pronation of the hand. There is also sagittal motion of the median nerve during pronation, and it also can be a normal finding. In four out of the ten volunteers, the median nerve moved towards the volar aspect, while in about three patients, or three volunteers, the nerve moved towards the dorsal aspect. So again, no real predilection towards what side it's moving, but it does move often during the pronation of the hand. Showing that movement relative to the capitate bone in a normal volunteer, median nerve, flexor carpi radialis, capitate bone. And in this, in this volunteer, there was about six millimeters of a dorsal movement of the median nerve relative to the capitate. Now, how do we do this uh, movement from supination to pronation? How is it best accomplished? We we'll actually start typically as we us usually started when we were making static images of the carpal tunnel in supination of the hand placing the transducer uh, over the distal palmar crease. And we assess the position of the median nerve relative to the flexor carpi radialis and relative to the capitate. And then we follow that maneuver by pronating the hand, placing it first in neutral position, doing the same measurements of the median nerve position relative to the flexor carpi radialis and the capitate bone. 
Then, of course, by subtraction, we came to the movement of the median nerve, both in the coronal and the sagittal plane. The median nerve cross-sectional diameter, we still uh, measured that uh, with a, measuring a surface area, uh, taking this as our cutoff value uh, below the, ten, the 0 0.1 we call normal, over 0 0.1 we call abnormal, showing you that surface area measured by ultrasound. It used to be when we started out measuring, we only measured the AP diameter and the coronal diameter. We multiplied those. And now with the current technology, we always measure surface area instead. The transverse images are also followed by longitudinal images showing the area of maximum swelling. Showing here the anatomy of the median nerve in the carpal tunnel the flexor retinaculum, relative to Guion's canal and the location of the ulnar nerve. Again, look at the position of the median nerve relative to capitate and the flexor carpi radial. So from clinical experience, Dr. Didmars, our plastic surgeon, uh, had noticed that in certain professions, as in sonography, in patient and dental hygienists with carpal tunnel disease and in com, uh, computer users, uh, also radiologists using PAC systems, they often oppose their thumb and their index finger in a sort of a pinch maneuver they, they're performing on their instruments uh, while holding a probe or a mouse or other instrument. Now that is typically held in a prone uh, neutral or prone uh, flexed position of the wrist and we kind of decided we would try to kind of uh, mimic that maneuver utilizing that pinch maneuver in our ultrasound examination. Shown here is um, in the pronated position of the hand, the pinch maneuver of the, of the index to thumb pinching. Now how do we do practically when we scan? Uh, we have the patient hold for three to five seconds in a fairly tight pinch uh, during the uh, visualization of the median nerve over the uh, carpal tunnel. Now, how does that look on ultrasound? Uh, you see the patient or the person pinching, and you can actually notice how there's some movement of the median nerve, but there is no entrapment uh, within the carpal tunnel. Now, this slide shows you side-by-side -side comparison of movement of the median nerve on ultrasound during pinch maneuver in an asymptomatic individual. And as you see, once the pinching starts, there is some movement of the median nerve, but the median nerve is not entrapped within the carpal tunnel. So there is some flattening and some change in the position of the median nerve, but the median nerve does not entrap within the carpal tunnel during this simple pronation pinch maneuver. So there's no sagittal movement uh, with this uh, um, maneuver. Now in our subject uh, population in the normals, pinch maneuver revealed no real sagittal motion. In 9 out of 10 individuals, there was slight movement of the uh, median nerve. The one patient who demonstrated some mobility promptly uh, demonstrated return to the pre pinch position after cessation of the pinch maneuver. Now the next maneuver we uh, routinely now use in practice is flexion pinch. Now that flexion pinch maneuver too is done uh, in, with the hand in pronation and we are holding for about two to three seconds and then we release and have the wrist come back to neutral position. When an individual does that, uh, most of the time there is indeed some sagittal movement of the median nerve relative to the carpal tunnel in, uh, even in asymptomatic individuals. Again, you see the movement of the median nerve into the carpal tunnel with the flexion pinch. Follow the nerve here, flexion pinch, the nerve is entrapped or moves sagittally in the carpal tunnel and moves back out. So sagittal movement of the nerve is quite common in flexion pinching.
Now the median nerve in this case uh, dives deep into the groove between the flexor pollicis longus and the flexor digitorum tendons. Upon return of the wrist to, to neutral, the median nerve very spontaneously reduces. Motion of, in, the, in the groove between the flexor tendons and the flexor pollicis longus uh, is a normal finding. Now, in several of our symptomatic patients with carpal tunnel disease, we've noticed that the, that the median nerve entraps within the carpal tunnel in between the, the tendons of the flexor pollicis longus and the flexor digitorum and does not spontaneously reduce to its anatomic position. This is an example of one of those entrapments. Notice that with pinching and pronation and with flexion of the wrist, the nerve is entrapped within the carpal tunnel, and this is the uh, median nerve kind of sagittally located, and there is actually an indentation from the flexor digitorum uh, tendons upon the median nerve and no return to normal, causing symptoms of carpal tunnel disease. So this is a very, very symptomatic patient. It's actually a sonographer who developed, uh, after uh, years of musculoskeletal sonography, uh, carpal tunnel disease. In summary, median nerve is a flexible structure and I hope that I could convince you today that you should look at carpal tunnel disease as in some patients a dynamic disease of the median nerve. Sagittal motion during a pinch maneuver, while not very common, can be a normal finding, especially when the nerve returns to its normal anatomic position after cessation of the maneuver. Sagittal motion in the, of the tendon in the groove between the flexor digitorum tendons and the flexor pollicis longus during flexion and pinch maneuver is common even in normals, but the nerve should return to its original position when the pinch maneuver and the wrist returns to normal. Some carpal tunnel syndrome patients demonstrate entrapment of the median nerve in the groove without a return to the anatomic position with cessation of the maneuver. Now, this may lead to continuous mass effect of the tendons on the median nerve and as possibly an important etiology uh, of carpal tunnel disease in certain professions. I thank you for your attention.